Hello everyone, welcome to session two of LTEC 651. In this week's video, we're going to review the results of the session one survey. Then we're going to introduce Sweller's cognitive load theory and we'll end by covering Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Before we get started, I wanted to compliment all of you on Critical Reflection 1. I like how you dove right in, even though it was clear that some of you were encountering Loom for the first time. Don't worry, it gets easier, and before you know it, you'll be a master at recording these video reflections. Of course, the central task for this week's critical reflection was to use screenshots and citations from the reading to answer three questions. One, what forms of media were used in the instructional multimedia program about the space shuttle? Two, how were the different forms of media combined and organized? And three, did you think this was an effective example of instructional multimedia? Why or why not? Now, overall, I thought you produced some excellent analyses of the sample multimedia message. The goal of doing this was to help us develop a critical eye for analyzing and evaluating existing multimedia instructional messages. And the content in today's video will give you some new concepts and tools for thinking about the strengths and weaknesses of multimedia design. So keep that in mind as we move forward. So next up, we have the prior knowledge survey. All in all, 22 of you completed the survey, so let's take a look at the results. The vast majority of you are comfortable installing new software on your computers and managing your files. Not surprisingly, these are important skills when it comes to producing interactive media, as we'll need to be able to keep track of source files and know where to put them when we want to share our work with others. Now, don't panic if you're one of the people who disagreed with these items. I'll be here to guide you as needed when things get a bit more technical. So the next set of questions asked about your familiarity with various web technologies, specifically HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And here we see a little bit of a split, which is good for me to know early in the semester. If we look at the HTML question, we could see that roughly 67% or 15 of you agreed or strongly agreed that you have some experience reading and writing HTML. That said, another seven of you reported being neutral or disagreeing. My takeaway here is that there's probably someone just like you in this course of 22 students. When it comes to style sheets, we see a little bit of a difference. 54% of you said you agreed or strongly agreed, whereas our neutrals and or strongly disagrees made up the remaining 46%. So here we're seeing almost a 50-50 split when it comes to style sheets. For JavaScript, we see even more people answering neutral or disagree to strongly disagree. In fact, only 22% agreed or strongly agreed with having experience with JavaScript. This is to be expected and should be no cause for alarm. These are things we'll cover in the weeks ahead if and when we need them. I just needed to know up front where people are related to these technologies, and now I can make adjustments to the course accordingly. Now, importantly, two of the questions were theory related. So you could see here on the left, this question asked if you're familiar with Sweller's cognitive load theory. And we could see here that over 70% of you reported neutral, disagree, or strongly disagreed. That is helpful for me to know and is why we're covering some of Sweller's work today. We see a similar distribution in relation to Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning, which is arguably a bit more popular. So with this information in mind, I want to touch upon these two theories in the rest of today's video. As I hope to make clear, they are foundational when it comes to the production of quality instructional multimedia. So let's review those theories. First, let's talk about cognitive load theory. Cognitive load is the idea of cognitive effort or the amount of information processing that's required to perform a given task. Now, importantly, different tasks require different levels of cognitive load or effort. 
This is important because working memory, the part of our brain that processes what we're doing, can only deal with a limited amount of information at a given time. And therefore, cognitive load or effort is something that's important for us as designers of multimedia to keep track of. From a designer's point of view, there are three possible types of cognitive load, intrinsic, extrinsic, and germane cognitive load. So let's talk about those three types. Now the first type, intrinsic cognitive load, is caused by the inherent complexity of the material you're asking someone to learn. And that's because people have to mentally represent the presented material in their working memory. And so if that material is more complex, the intrinsic cognitive load increases. Intrinsic cognitive load involves selecting relevant information from a presentation and organizing it as it's presented. For those of you who are familiar with Mayer's multimedia learning theory, intrinsic cognitive load is related to essential processing. In other words, the cognitive processing that has to happen in order for someone to make sense of a given presentation. So if you take a look at the example on the right, here we see these nested circles representing the real number system. And the smallest one, the yellow one, are natural numbers. And then we have whole numbers, then integers, then rational numbers, then irrational numbers. What does this have to do with intrinsic cognitive load? Well, the smaller the circle, the less inherently complex the topic. That's why when we introduce children to mathematics, we start with natural numbers and whole numbers. Once they get fluent in understanding those concepts, then we begin to introduce negative numbers and integers. And from there, we introduce rational and irrational numbers. The idea is, is that the intrinsic cognitive load or the inherent complexity of these circles is inherently different. And as educators, we need to be aware of the inherent complexity of the material we're asking learners to learn. Now, here's another example. You've all heard the expression, it's not rocket science. And of course, that's a common phrase, meaning that something is not too difficult or is easy to understand. In other words, it's the opposite of rocket science. And rocket science is picked on in this expression because rocket science is known to be complicated. In other words, understanding the physics of a rocket moving through space is inherently complex. And therefore, the intrinsic cognitive load needed to learn rocket science is higher than, say, learning basic addition. Now let's talk about the second kind of cognitive load, and that's extraneous cognitive load. And that has to do with the way information or tasks are presented to learners. Extraneous cognitive load is unwanted processing because it does not support the instructional goal of learning the material. Extraneous cognitive load can be caused by poor instructional design. And even though there's processing of poor instructional design, that results in no useful knowledge being constructed in working memory. So a really simple example is shown here on the right. This is a humorous example, of course, but imagine teaching a baby how to walk. You would never ask a baby to learn how to walk on a patch of ice. Why? Because that ice is serving no useful purpose. It's extraneous cognitive load. And so you would... So you would never ask a baby to learn how to walk on ice. That's an example of extraneous cognitive load. Now, here's another example. So this is a screenshot that I found from some multimedia presentation. And take a look at the layout of this information. There's lots of colors. There's different shapes. There's arrows pointing in all different directions. The way this information is presented, it's not clear to learners how to put together this information in a way that would result in some sort of new knowledge or understanding. And so this is an example of extraneous cognitive load caused by poor instructional design. You can also relate extraneous cognitive load to the design of bad websites. So here's an example of a website that's just completely overwhelming in the way that it presents its information. And so that causes a lot of extraneous or unwanted 
cognitive effort for whoever has to make sense of this website. Now, the third kind of cognitive load is generative cognitive load. And this cognitive load is caused by the learner's motivation to learn. And it refers to the cognitive processing aimed at making sense of the presented material. It involves reorganizing the incoming information and integrating it with relevant prior knowledge. In short, germane cognitive load results in the, in the construction of an integrated mental model. And one of the ways I like to think about it is when a student who says, oh, I get it, that's like this. That means that the student has used their germane processing to make sense of the material and connect it to something they already know. That's the result of germane cognitive processing. Now, another example can be seen here with this highlighted text. In this example, designers have used different strategies to help promote generative or germane processing. Examples include emphasizing key vocabulary, providing questions, and using flowcharts. Those are all strategies to help promote germane cognitive load, which is related to generative processing. So that, my friends, is cognitive load theory in a nutshell. So you might be wondering, well, what's the connection to multimedia production? The answer is, is that as designers and producers of multimedia instructional messages, we want to make sure that our designs minimize extrinsic cognitive load, account for intrinsic cognitive load, and promote germane cognitive load. And in the coming weeks, we'll be learning about research-based design principles that will help us create effective multimedia instructional messages. So that's the connection to multimedia production. All right, now let's move on to Mayer's cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Now, the cognitive theory of multimedia learning has been around for a, a, quite a few years now, and it's based on three assumptions about the way the human mind processes information. The first assumption is the dual channel assumption, and this is the assumption that humans possess separate information processing channels for visual spatial material and auditory verbal material. This means that information presented to the eyes is processed in a visual channel. And we can contrast that with information presented to the ears, which is processed in an auditory channel. Now, the implication of the dual channel assumption for multimedia design is pretty simple. Well-designed multimedia instructional messages should leverage the auditory verbal channel and the visual pictorial channel. And in the space shuttle example we looked at for Critical Reflection 1, we saw an example of that where there was both audio and visual information for the, the learner to process. Now, the second assumption that the cognitive theory of multimedia learning is based on is called the limited capacity assumption. And this is the idea that humans are limited in the amount of information that can be processed in each of those channels at one time. Now, you've all heard the idea that we can process five to seven chunks of information. That's actually why phone numbers are seven digits. This limited capacity forces us to make decisions about certain things. As humans, we have to make decisions about what pieces of incoming information we're going to pay attention to. The world is full of information, but we can only process bits and pieces of it at a time. Relatedly, we have to make decisions about the degree to which we're going to build connections between all of those selected pieces of information that we're processing. And thirdly, we have to make a decision about the degree to which we're going to build connections between the information we're processing in working memory and the information we already know in long-term memory. Now, the implication for multimedia design is this. Well-designed multimedia instructional messages should limit the amount of material being presented all at one time. And it should never force learners to hold large amounts of information in memory. Now, if we think back to the space shuttle example we looked at last week, we saw that the designers of that multimedia instructional message broke that information up into discrete pieces. 
so that it was coming out piece by piece. That was a way to not overwhelm the learner's working memory. The third assumption behind the cognitive theory of multimedia learning is the active processing assumption. And this is the idea that humans engage in active learning by selecting relevant incoming information, organizing that incoming information into a coherent mental representation, and then they integrate incoming information with other existing knowledge. These three steps, selecting, organizing, and integrating, only happen deliberately. Humans have to actively process and engage in learning by selecting, organizing, and integrating information. The implication for multimedia design is that well-designed multimedia instructional messages should have a coherent structure and provide guidance on how to build that structure in working memory. So those are the three assumptions that the cognitive theory of multimedia learning are based on. Now, here is a graphic that Mayer in 2005 produced to describe his cognitive theory of multimedia learning. And the way you read this graphic is from left to right. So on the left, we see the multimedia presentation of words and pictures. Humans use their sensory memory in the form of ears and eyes, and they can choose, they don't have to, but they can choose to select words and select images to process in working memory. If learners actively process those sounds and images, they can begin to organize the words and images into a verbal and pictorial model that they can hold in memory. And notice that there are two tracks there, one for the auditory channel and one for the visual channel. That information can be integrated in working memory. And then ultimately, the next step is to integrate that information with what we already know about the world. In other words, our prior knowledge. And if something new is processed in working memory and successfully integrated with prior knowledge, then it gets stored into our long-term memory for later use. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.